It's Speaking with Gravity. I'm Curving, your host. On this podcast, we talk about mental health and how everything affects everything. As I often like to say, I'm a son, a brother, a husband, a father, a friend who also happens to be a therapist. When you sit with a therapist, the conversation is different and it's definitely going to be different today because I have two other co-hosts and I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves at this point in time to my left. Hi, I am Dee Carpenter. I'm a master's level social worker, higher education professional. I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, and I'm a friend. I am your black therapist. Good morning, everyone. My name is Taisha Williams. I'm a licensed master social worker. Um, Currently work as a medical social worker. Have experience providing mental health services to individuals here in our community. And with every episode, the goal is to have a conversation and make everyone listening, make you think, make you feel, make you do what's best for you. Remember, I'm a therapist, but this isn't therapy. It's a podcast. And today we're going to start off just a little bit different than we have in the past. I'm going to give uh, a couple of fun facts here. Uh, fun fact, in a recent research, this is research-based now, found that a majority of non-black voters in 2016 believed America had changed for the worst since 1950s. Never mind the civil rights um, for African Americans, women, um, African Americans in general, or women, um, or LG, equal rights for women, or LGBT community. Never mind all of that. Um, but it had changed for the worst since the 1950s. And on top of that, um, most of those persons that supported the president that won in 2016, um, they thought that immigration and terrorism was the most important issues uh, with regards to the presidential election. That's fun fact number one. Did y'all have anything that y'all wanted to to, to add to that or talk about uh, on that one? If not, then we can go ahead and go to the next one because we're setting up we're setting up our topic for today. But did y'all want to have it, put in any input on that one? I'm going to leave the past in the past yeah. in regards <laughs> yeah. to that. We got a new president now, so we ain't even worried about that. Um, number two, fun fact. Um, and this is very similar to our career path, too. Um, was, I was going over, a, looked at an article about a former Facebook manager, and he felt like uh, black America should stop playing the victim role. Um, and that led me to kind of look up some other things, and it, I found that black people make up less than 3% of all engineers. Um, also, I've seen, I think it was, three percent or four percent of all psychologists are black so that's uh man when you're talking about like career path and just thinking about that for us i don't know maybe i take it for granted in our field because you know everybody i see is is black (laughs) (laughs) but in general you know um, when I'm looking at social media, I'm on um, Twitter. I just I see people saying it's so hard to find black therapists. We're here, um, but I, I don't I don't know. When you look at those stats, it just it throws me off. It makes me feel bad too. Y'all got anything in, any any input on that one? <laughs> I'm when it comes to tech, I'm not surprised at the number. However, I will say just given research and even in the media highlighting the importance of STEM. Those who don't know what STEM means, Mm. science, science, technology, engineering, they're now adding an A. So it will be STEAM for arts and then in mathematics. Um, And I know here in our hometown, every year they have this free STEM event. Um, It's family oriented where children can learn about, again, all of the acronyms that I just spelled out. Um, So I think exposure now with introducing us into the tech world is happening um and i foresee it rising yeah exposure is always good it's always good it can only get better um and then the other fun fact uh was and i did not know this uh, i was looking at this starting in 2024 films that wish to be eligible for best picture oscar 
must meet certain diversity requirements. Um, one of those was, uh, oh, I don't know, I don't know exactly what it was. I think it says film must meet at least two of the four new standards, and I don't know what the actual standards are um, on diversity. But so in three years, it's 2021, and in three years, in order to be considered for best picture. Oscar, you gotta meet certain diversity requirements. And I, I think this is an unpopular opinion, but I don't know how I feel about that one. Um yes. just, you know, forcing right. people to do to Forced be inclusion. diverse yeah. based on, you know, what you put on paper. I feel like um I always say all behavior is reinforced, right? So if you wanna reinforce diversity instead of saying this is the requirement just pick be- best pictures with diverse people on there. You don't have to say define it in the sense of okay, you got to do this and you got to do that, because some films ain't gonna work with the diversity requirements. I, I I won't say that they won't work, but it just may not be as good of a look if it was just it, if it didn't think if the director and the people associated with it didn't have to think about those requirements. So I don't really like that one. I'm with you on that. I think when you're talking about diversity and when you're talking about inclusion, it should not be mandated. I mean, we're talking about 2021. This should be the standard for practices. You know, um, we already have a society where we are getting paid less um, despite the equivalence of our performance. And in most times, we're excelling our counterparts. So to say that a film is going to be rewarded because they decided to include us. We were already present. Like that's really, it's really like a slap in the face, but here's <laughs> something for you. Um, you know, just to say that we're moving in that direction, but you know, we'll take every little step forward, but I, I do think, you know, I can see where the, where the effort was put in for it, but uh, yeah. yeah, I'm with you on that. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't jumping off no bridge because that's that's becoming a standard. I mean, it's you talking about 2024, so we got to go through three more years of what we doing now? Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> like, let's make but this e- effective immediately. Even when you said 2021, I, I don't know why I didn't think about it earlier, but it's like in 2021, we're still making standards or, right. or we're having to put this in writing mm-hmm. for somebody to be more accept, accepting or just be more willing to include diversity in their staff members or right. in that's crazy and civil rights was what 1950s 60s here we are 70 years later 50 years later I, I, i'm not a math major so don't 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 kill me on that <laughs> but here we are years later yeah um and we're still having to have these things written more or less into law in order to <laughs> to get the masses to uh, appeal to us Deeper than years, we're talking about generations. We're talking about generations later that people are yeah. still being expected to accept the bare minimum. So you're still not, even though you felt eloquent enough to identify four standards, but you only have to adhere to two? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a practice or if it's a rule, rules should apply to all. So don't set a bar that you're not really looking for people to meet. But and then that's I, just me. I wanted to if... So we had that movie come out recently, uh, American Skin. Right. And, again, I don't know. I didn't go into it and read all the initiatives or the standards. But I do know, well, no, in that movie they had um, black diverse. and white. Yeah, they had they had a diverse staff. Latino. They, yeah. they had representation in that movie, actually. But, some, you know, some movies ain't going to have that. You know, you think about Coming to America, the first one. <laughs> you know. First coming to America, I don't know how diverse it was, but can some of those movies, some of those movies that we've grown to love that are um, what they call them cult classics, uh, they usually don't get best Oscars anyway, but some of these movies, can we, Love Jones, uh, Love and Basketball, uh, are they going to meet that criteria because of their storyline and what they put in there? Um, that's that's crazy, but American Skin was diverse. I'm glad you said that. Um, speaking of of that, did y'all get a chance to look at it and see it? Yeah, definitely. Shout out. 
to park on that one, yeah. Did he um he didn't write it? Who did he write it? I don't know who wrote it. I believe he was an executive director yeah, yeah. and or executive producer, but don't quote us on that. Right. He <laughs> definitely had his hands involved yeah. with the development of the film, I'll say that. Um I love it. I love the film. Um I hate the ending of the film. Spoiler alert if we if we continue to talk about this. But uh, I did I did like it, and I thought it was a a good uh, I guess segue into what we're about to talk about here. Just looking at him as a father, right? Um, looking at what happened to his son, um, what it should have ended up as, as opposed to what it actually did. what actually happened. Um, I didn't really, I have to go back and look at it, but there was some type of rift between the mom and the dad, but they were still in communication with each other. Right, they were co-parenting yeah. um, from what it looks like. You know, the relationship had kind of taken its, its toll, but as far as, like, co-parenting and him being, you know, an active and involved father, you know, his, his presence was there. I think when you're looking at that movie, it shows the very dynamics of, you know, our topic that we're talking about today is um you know in terms of relationships and how sometimes the media portrays our notion of parents parenthood and fatherhood like that movie contrasts that you have a very active and present father um who who is sacrificing himself you know for the betterment of his son in terms of you know the job that he obtained so that his child would have better opportunity not even looking at the fact that you know he had serviced his country you know he he had contributed so much and given so much of himself to protect others and in the moment the very people he protected didn't protect him um so you know when we looking when we're looking at that i just uh you know that, that movie was deep for me you know i had to go back and watch it several times because it hit on some very, you know, critical assessments. Um, again, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen it, but, you know, just the way it communicated how, um, you know, the very people that destroy us then come back and ask us for help. You know what I'm saying? To say we need to stop the violence. We need to go out and speak against what's going on. But you're not acknowledging the pain that has been ignited within us based on the actions that have been conducted. Like, there's no no conviction with that. But, again, I digress. And the topic for today is living while black. You know, um, I think sometimes people that are non-black may look at us and say, is this really real? Is racism really real? Is microaggressions re really real? Um, and all the other things that, you know, we we deal with i think um, we alluded to it just earlier how uh, sometimes you have to be better than just to be in a conversation mm -hmm. you know you <laughs> you could be like really 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 great at what you do but overall you just oh, okay he's he's a representation he's a black person in this field um so just we just want to kind of dialogue about uh living while black and um, we've already kind of talked about this prior to um, the coming on air or online or however we, however we say it now. <laughs> um, we used to say on air back in the day. But uh, our, one of our first questions was, or we talked about, was just defining what it means to be black. Mm -hmm. um, each one of us defining that. And as y'all get y'all thoughts together, um, I did think about it. Man, uh, what it means to be black. I think I initially told y'all, I think it's the dopest thing in the world because I think we're super creative um, in general. But I also, um, I also was looking at a at a film, and man, uh, I almost, I almost cried. This film was done or, or came out in '76. Um, oh jeez, it was uh, Bill Moyers, Rosedale. This is it. I think it's on YouTube. And it was talking about um, kind of middle class uh, African Americans mo moving into somewhat of a mm -hmm. up and coming um, neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But the part that that really got to me was the kids. There were um, some black kids and some white kids, and the white kids were walking, were coming down the street, and 
they was just going down the street. They saw a crowd. They was going down the street and they was attracted to the crowd. And it just so happened that there was a crowd of white kids and they were already being interviewed about the black kids coming into their neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And kind of walked up uh, or kind of came into that and the white kids was like, no, get out. We don't want you. We don't, we don't know anything. We don't want you here, mm-hmm. pretty much. And, you know, and there was name calling back and forth. But it's when, when I say, when I'm trying to define what it means to be black, it's like you want to be a part of some of the things that we do with regards to our music, with regards to our style, but you want to be in control of how you are a part of that. Like, okay, I'm cool with listening to the music. I'm cool with taking some of your fashion statements and, and, and applying it, but don't come live next to me. Um, and it's not, and, and I don't want to make this just a black and white thing, but I think it's other cultures too. We just it's more black and white in America because that's probably the, the biggest predominant. Yeah. The predominant, but um, just even though we're cool, it's like we're not accepted. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and I had some other things that I was thinking that that won't cut on my mind right now, but that that was it for me. But I'm like unapologetically right. black. Like I love it. I love being me. Um, <laughs> I love what I bring to the table. I love what the people before me that's brought to the table. You know, I, I hate that they had to endure what they had to endure and what they had to go through. And a lot of times we're often quick to say, well, I wouldn't have did that. I wouldn't do that. Um, in that moment. In that moment, you, you don't know what you would have done. I think I, I'm more aware now not to do certain things. But, right. you know, I, I don't know. If I, if I had a choice of whether to live and see my kids grow up or... Um, commit, you know, suicide or something right. because I didn't want to do All what right, they told me to do. I don't know what I would do uh, when I think about it right now. So that's it. That's it for me. Uh, what about you, Ty? We're gonna go to you, Ty. We're gonna jump. <laughs> um, honestly, I'm I'm still even now processing and thinking about that question because what does it mean to be black? Um. Black is a color, so who says we're black? Mm-hmm. You know, so even that term alone, and then where does that term, where did that term even originate from? And then the historical meanings behind that term of black, and then even those who choose to identify as African American, where did that term originate from? Even mm-hmm. just African within itself. So, right here, right now, being completely honest. I'm still confused as how do I identify as I'm continuing to learn more about my history, my culture. To me, it's a question mark, but I'm grateful for where I am currently. I'm grateful for the experience um, of, of being, I guess, this luxury of, of having this melanated skin, yes, so you know, if, if we're going to speak on melanin, you know, from it being a pigment, like I, I'm grateful for it. Um, the color of my skin, if we're going to talk about black and it being a color, it has awarded me a lot and I, I'm just grateful for it. So my mind, I'm rambling right now, but honestly, that, there's a question mark with that. Mm-hmm. And what about you? I mean, I, I, I'm a collaboration. I think in my present understanding, it means for me resilience, um, preservation, tenacity, you know, a warrior of the past and the present. Um, but I agree with Ty, um, you know, as I'm elevating mentally, as I'm growing as an individual, I'm still learning what it truly means to be black. I feel like a lot of what I currently understand is associated with my, you know, upbringing and my personal experiences. Um, And some of that is a result of secondary trauma, you know, mental and emotional experiences. And so for me, it's still it's still evolving um, that definition. But what I know is it's something that I'm no longer, you know, I'm not going to say no longer. I don't think I've ever been ashamed of. Um, but it's something that I'm not making an excuse for. Um, you know, I, I'm not trying to be accepted into your 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 notions or whatever. I think, um, you know, as we talk about things in this society, um, elaboration on, you know, black is kind of the way we are brought up and the way we are taught, um, depending on where you grew up, grow up at. You know, we kind of taught black, being black is a sin. Like it's a, you know, yeah. it's something you shouldn't, you know, 
actually be proud of or you something you shouldn't participate in um you know or, or the fact that you know being black automatically makes you a criminal yeah. being black automatically makes you uneducated <laughs> or unprofessional and so setting that standard or that mind frame i'm either trying to work against it to prove to you that's not what i'm equivalent to um you know or, or vice versa but in my present state, I'm just like, I'm just showing up and I'm going to be who I am and I'm going to own who I am. And you're either going to accept it or you're not. But one thing I do is you're going to respect it. And that's, that's, that's just where I am. So I'm still learning what it means to be black, but I do know where I am now. I'm proud of it. And that ain't changing. I don't know how, how long we keep learning it. I do know that I have continued to learn throughout the years. Uh, and I think it's important that as we learn and that we do really identify in our mind what it is. It can kind of keep right, changing, right. but we got to identify because if we don't identify what it is for us, there's some, that's not a good look. You know, uh, a big part of like just mental health and life in general is knowing who you are. Um, for me, one of those things is being, being black, uh, being black and being a therapist, like you, I hear people say, they always amazed. Yeah, if I go somewhere just random, <laughs> what do you do? Right. Uh, uh, I'm a therapist, and you could just and it, now it doesn't matter who it is is asking that question. Right. Not it doesn't matter what color they are, but they're amazed that okay, hold up, this is not a a career that is associated with that this type of individual. Either that be it because I'm a man or because I'm black, or maybe both. Um, so that's a part of my identity as well. Uh, I like what you said about um, growing up. Um, you kind of taught that black is bad. Right. Uh, I think, you know, when they're asking me that question about what I do, and I tell them, and it's like, okay, hold up. So he's not, I ain't going to say a dope dealer. But the he rule of exception. Yeah, he's, yeah. yeah he's, he's an exception to the rule. Yeah. Uh, I remember hearing people say, you talk black. Well, what is talking black? Right. I even had somebody to break that down for me one time. And they were saying, um, you say the, the B word. I be this, I be doing this, I be doing that. I was like, <laughs> oh, wow, snap. I do say that all the time. Uh, and it, it was another word that he said, I can't think of it right now. But it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, right. you know, when, I, when I think about that, I think about, and I got to shout out Clubhouse on this one, but I was in a, in a recent room, and one of the statements that was made was like, we look at blackness as a monologue. Like, all of us are the same, and we're not. No, we're we not. Are so, <laughs> we are so diverse, right. even within our diversity. So, like, that's the beauty of us. Like, we come in all different shades. We come in all different spectrums. And our experiences are all different. You know, even sitting in this room, we don't share the identical same experiences. Our passion and why we chose this career field is not the same. And so, until as a society until as a nation we can understand that you can't put all of us in one box baby because we don't fit you know what i'm saying like until you acknowledge and accept that like i'm sorry i can't help you you know what i'm saying and that's just you know that's the creativeness and that you spoke on of being the proudness of it and that's the beauty of us i mean and i think that's what ty was kind of talking about when you're saying what you know are we truly black what are we because when you say that it's just so much power and you know what I'm saying it's just so many different uh, arenas that you're going to see when you actually bring us into a same space and so again stop looking at us to be just one thing this is black 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 yeah. with, you know with white writings but we are definitely more than that now I'm proud to be black but we're more than that I enjoy showing the difference Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not, you know, your typical, or I feel like I'm not your typical um, black male. But even as I say that, what am I doing? Right. You know, when I say typical black male, what am I, I'm then doing what I'm asking them not to do? Yeah, I'm trying to put, yeah. Like. Um, and Ty, you look like you itching over there <laughs> to, to bring something to the forefront. Um, oh, body language. We're going to talk about communication. Okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> But you are right. Again, um, I'm just trying to be as transparent as I can be. I have a lot of notes right here, but honestly, I'm not even trying to be scripted. But I do think it just goes back again. We have to understand the origin of these terms that we mm -hmm. have, that we're using to identify and describe ourselves as. And it's not anything negative, but for me, 
in this moment in my life, it's really important that I continue to explore, well, why am I calling myself black? Well, why am I calling myself an African-American? Where did these terms originate from? Mm -hmm. What did my ancestors identify as prior to being enslaved? Because, well, for me, I, granted, I don't know all of my ancestral lineage, Mm -hmm. but I know being here in the United States, pretty sure they're from the West part of Africa. Um, But again, I could be completely wrong. Um, but I'm again, I'm, I'm just still questioning it. But however, I do think too that we have been able to reclaim that term of what it is to be black, like with Stokely, what is it, Stokely Carmichael, yeah. um, mm-hmm. the Black Panther movement, um, even W.E. Du Bois. I know he mentioned in one of his works, um, I think it's The Souls of Black Folk, mm-hmm. where he just talked about the double consciousness of, of being black, you know. Um, I think he says like the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. Um, And that just goes back to, again, I think of having a knowledge of self. Once we know who we truly are Mm -hmm. as beings, what others have identified and labeled us as, it it no longer exists. So, yeah. I I know labels um, are, uh, I think they're important. But like um, when you were saying that about black African American, I, I attach myself to all of those black African American. Right. I don't care, you know, if a person call me black. I don't care what they call me. I don't even. I can't say I don't, don't care that they color. call. I can't no, say. Don't yeah. call me color. Um, no. Oh man, I, I, I got a <laughs> crazy story about that. Maybe we'll talk about that one day. Um, it was funny though. But color, I feel like if you're telling me that, you're trying to say something else. Right. But had I not known that past that was associated mm-hmm. with that, then I wouldn't really care. Mm-hmm. Um, do you do you all think we should change it to something else? Because it's like it's like every few years we go from it was ne- at some point from colored to Negro, from Negro to I believe black, and then from black to African American. I believe I got it in the right order. But they changed it over time. Um, I don't think it really made. A difference if I am attaching whatever they call me to something good. I think it's still like what you said, W. Du Bois said. If I'm looking at whatever they call me through their eyes, so if they call me African American and they associate it with something negative, then I'm gonna take African American as negative, right? But if I look at it in my eyes, it don't matter what you call me. I'm dope. I'm good. That's how I view it. But do y'all think it matter? Should we change it again from African American to uh, um, to something else to just American? I think that's ongoing, and some people are going to differ with that um, mm-hmm. because again, I think it goes back to some people say, "Well, I don't even know my ancestry or lineage, so yeah. therefore I just want to identify as black, or I don't even know if I want to identify again as African because I don't know my lineage." So I feel like it's going to forever. No, I don't want to say forever. It's going to be ongoing right now with a question mark opposed to a period of do I identify as black or do I identify as African American? People of color. A person of color, color. right. You get what I'm saying? Um, Oh, yeah, that's been a thing late, person of color, POC. But it it is true. Am I not a person of color? Yeah, I am. I I also saw a post, you know, I, I love these posts, these cleverness. Where it says, I'm not on um, today's, <laughs> it's February this month. I'm not a POC. I am blackly black, black. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love uh, it. And I'm definitely with that one. Um, but yeah, dang. Y'all are bringing something totally different that I didn't even think about when it comes down to that, just attaching that name to us. Well, I think you have to be careful with labeling, um, mm-hmm. just kind of like you said, because what, you know, we, we give names to stuff and we give it power, mm-hmm. but you can't allow that name to define who you, you know, what you kind of say, internalize yourself to be, and kind of like what Ty is. You don't have to become what other people say, right. but I think it's it's also in the way in which you say certain things to people, you know what I'm saying? If you're doing it in a derogative way or you're doing it to try to degrade me, then, you know, that's one thing, but if you're doing it from a state of um, communicational practices or you know what I'm saying 
anybody can get offended by anything. You know what I'm saying? There are certain people that will be offended if you call them African American. There will be people that will be offended if you call them black. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, because there is no consistent, you know, standard, it's hard to say what's acceptable. But I think when you go back to some of the prior language that you discussed, those words were intentionally used to actually degrade us to dehumanize us so of course when you try to speak that language to me now that's offensive but in terms of whether you say you're a black person or you're african-american for me and like i said it in my present understanding i'm not offended by those statements but let's not go back to the n-word let's not go back like i said to color because again <laughs> that's because you you know what that language was associated with and how you were ad identifying. Um, I'm good with person of color. I'm good with people of color. I'm good with black. I'm good with African American. And maybe that will change. You just know? don't call you color. Don't call me color. What about Negro? Boy, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, it's just something you know. Mama don't play that. Um, and you know, I I'm one of those people though. As 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 I'm growing and as I'm learning too, mm -hmm. I gotta ask people. You know what I'm saying? I think. In terms of to teach people how not to use a certain language, I also got to take it out of my own vocabulary, too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Even though it may be a mutual word of respect and, you know, within our culture, I think sometimes we reinforce the idea of how can it be so offensive, yet you use it. You know what I'm saying? And so, I, again, when we're talking about language, like kind of going back to that statement you said earlier, it kind of offends me when people say you talk black or you talk white. Language is so diverse. Mm -hmm. So how can you actually identify or associate it with a specific type of people. Yeah. Language is meant to be interpreted. That's why we have Spanish. That's why we have, you know, all these other different French. That's, I mean, we have all of these different languages and you don't get to say a oh, proper vocabulary is only attached to white people. Again, how we are taught at such an early age that black is wrong. I'm sorry if I am well diverse and I can communicate in a way, but I'm also sorry if in our household we, what's up, yo, whatever. If that's how I want to communicate, that's my form of communication and I choose to do so. And I think that's the beauty of the African-American vernacular yeah. language. Dr. Rita Walker talks about that a lot, again, in her book, The Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health. I'm going to keep talking about that as often as I can because it definitely opened my eyes, not only as a clinician, but just even as a, as a being, you know, um, and being able to embrace that because oftentimes I can remember growing up, I would criticize myself not using the standard American yeah. English language correctly. <laughs> Who's to say that that's even correct? Yeah. Again, right. you know, yeah. so we define that. There well, we, we go. And I think, it. again, a lot of this goes back to understanding who we are as beings. You talked about culture a lot, D, and Kervin, you did too. But I feel like we we don't even connect because we don't even know our culture. You know, you have others who are able to identify with their culture, have their own language, have their certain values and traditions. And not to say that we don't, but to an extent we don't, we're still lost. That cultural identity is lost. And again, Dr. Rita Walker talks about that a lot, too. So when we're experiencing a lot of these adversities... We don't really have nothing to fall back on because our culture, to an extent, was script. Well, yeah, it was stripped away, not scripted. Yeah. Excuse me, it was stripped away from us. But due to the beauty of technology and us being advanced beings, we're starting to find out more about who we truly are as people. You know, um, I think we're still. Yeah. I think we're finding out who we were. But I also think we're evolving to be even better. Like mm -hmm. we, we as a people, if you really look at it, there are a lot of black professionals. Like you know, people act like it's just some, you know, <laughs> rarity or some specialty. But no, there are a, a lot of black professionals. Or uh, you know, and uh, you know, we talk about being well educated, but it's some. There's a lot of people that did not go to anybody's school that are very intelligent. You know yeah. what I'm saying? <clears throat> Self-taught. You know, reading yeah. books. Read. So the idea, the notion that you know everything is uh, is attached from to someone of you know our counterparts is no, sweetie. You know this is who we are. I think this is who we've always been, and that again goes back to that resiliency. Is that mm. even when you try to strip our identity from us, we're coming back even stronger. So like you tried to destroy us for generations, and yes, it may have let us down for a little bit, but we're still coming back, and we're defining who we are and who we want to be. And so you know, I think 
in in a way that's intimidating for a lot of other people and they people don't want to acknowledge it but you know that creates fear in people you yeah, mean yeah. to tell us that we yeah. shackled you we beat you down we killed you we hung you and you still coming back You're saying, still here we still here you see us you know yeah. what i'm saying when you see us and i i know that movie has so much of a controversy but the length, the title of that when you see us I think when oh, you yeah. think about it, you yeah. know what I'm saying? You can look at it in it, but you still are showing the resilience of people. Like, you know, again, you tried to destroy these black men. And I'm not saying that their mental health was not impacted, but they are still here. And what you did was you created a, a powerhouse of individuals who changed the lives of people who followed them. So, again, your tactic really didn't help you. You know what I'm saying? What you're doing to destroy us is just, again, motivating us and inspiring us. You will knock us down, but we will not stay there. My opinion, but... You know, when, when you was talking about when they see us, as dope as I think I am or black people are, I also have in the back of my head, it can all, it can all be taken away from me at any moment. Because those kids in that particular situation, I was about to say a movie, but those kids in real life right, mm -hmm. right. were kids. Mm -hmm. They were in high school, playing around in the streets, and they get hemmed up because somebody did something, and they got this crime got placed on them. Right. And now here they are, 20 years after the fact, 30 years after the fact, whatever it was, their whole 20s right. are gone, mm -hmm. 30s are gone. And you go from high school to now, and you know, at high school at the time that that happened, they didn't have cell phones. Right. They didn't have social media. They got, they missed all of that. You took all of that from them. And, you know, they still here, but seeing stuff like that, not only seeing that it happened back in what, 93? I think it was, still 93, happened. 94? Right. And every year, it's always something. It's always somebody that some person in power has said, okay, we're going to get somebody for this particular crime, or we're going to get somebody, we're going to place this blame on somebody, and conveniently it's always us. Right. I shouldn't generalize it and say it's always us, but it, it darn sure seemed like that. It's always us. Um, we're still here, but I, I, I have back in the back of my head, no matter how cool I am, no matter what success I attain in life, it can all be taken away from me. Um, the only thing that doesn't make me angry about that is that I feel like I have God on my side as well. Right. Like, okay, do whatever you can do. The worst you can do is kill me. Mm -hmm. God got me. I, that's I, that's the only thing that keeps me sane. I think that we are, you know, I, 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 I want to be realistic. I think we all should proceed with caution. So I don't want to denounce that, you know, our safety is not important. And I think we do always need to be aware of our surroundings in us. But I also think this idea ideology of us having to live in constant fear like we don't we don't have to own that you know what i'm saying yeah. a lot of times you know there are a lot of people who are just afraid to actually say or speak up what they're experiencing or what they're feeling and if we're talking about mental health that's an internalized pain you know what i'm saying internalized emotions to where if you don't do anything with it that turns into anger and so mm -hmm. then we get into you know a society of people who are forced to then take part in these activities that you guys have deemed criminalized. You know what I'm saying? You you want us to, you know, just sit here and take it. And that's a, it's a critical part in American skin when he says, why are we the only people expected to turn the other cheek? Right. No <laughs> other race has to do that. And I'm out, you got, I mean, that, that was so powerful to me because I had to stop it, rewind it, play it again and really look at what it was saying. I know that it's just a movie, but to me, the people in that movie were not acting. That is the reality. Why are we forced to say, you slap me in my face, oh, it's okay, slap the other cheek, or just don't do it as hard. No, you know what I'm saying? And, and you know, that's not how other people respond to situations. Mm -hmm. That's not what the expectations of other people. We've seen that just recently, right, with the Capitol. You, you, I, didn't, you, I didn't see it. I didn't oh, you see didn't see it? it? No, oh, well. I missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we see it with the activity, right? The response yeah. of your 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 president get, didn't get reelected or your candidate didn't get reelected, and we, we wanted to turn the whole nation up. You know what I'm saying? So we don't get to do that and still come out on the other end. You know what I'm saying? We not even hearing names of these people. If they had have been of our descent, 
We would have knew their names. We would have knew where they worked. We would have knew <laughs> their family. They, they family. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? They would have been receiving depth. It's always something to that. And so that's what living while black is, is that, you know what I'm saying? We always have to proceed with caution. We don't let you, you always have to be aware and you always have to be conscious of how your behaviors are going to directly impact you and the people that surround you. And you know, a lot of times what we do it not only affects me, but it's going to affect my sister, too. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? It's yes. going to affect you, too, because the world sees us as one. Um, they don't see us as an individual action. but like, And that's the justification that they came. Well, that was them. That's not all of us. You know what I'm saying? That's what, yes. that's how they were acting. That's not. But when we're saying those same things, you do have an elect of people who, you know, I'm just saying, you know, there's some people in prison that deserve to be in prison because yes. of their behaviors. You know Absolutely. what I'm saying? We're not going to we excuse. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, we're not going to excuse some things. Yeah, you, you, you shot up the whole block. Yeah, you got to... <laughs> You got to serve a little time, but um, you know, in reality, it's just we don't get to say, "Oh, they did that because they were angry." Oh, they did that because it was that, and it's, it makes and it makes it okay, or it's a justification. It, I mean, it's yeah. yeah. I know this. When you were saying that about, oh man, you said a lot of stuff. Well, I'm gonna go to the Black Lives Matter. Uh, that was started. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong. Start on Twitter. Like, yeah. Black Lives Matter. And it just comes from a hashtag mm -hmm. about our lives matter too, right? That's yeah. the basis of it. Um, they were able to, to kind of create it into more. But to have, to take that and then say it's like a terrorist right. group. But no, somebody else do something similar. You don't make them a terrorist. You have to, count. we have to, the masses have to force that name onto them before they say, oh, okay, yeah. I guess we have to put them in that same category. It came from a hashtag. <laughs> right. And you made them into somebody that hates the government. Hate. No, we're just saying simply our life is matters as much as any yeah. other life. That's it. But, you know, <laughs> our lives are taken. You know, sometimes they give us, throw, throw us a couple of dollars. Uh, and they're like, okay, now be quiet. But that's somebody's life. That young lady was Breonna Taylor. She had a child, if I'm not mistaken, right? Did she have a, did she have a child? Or she didn't have a child? Nah, she didn't have a, I ain't read that nowhere now. Oh, Lord Here Jesus. I, I done put a child, yeah, on put child on her. Uh, I ain't read that about but Breonna she, Taylor. But she's somebody's child. R.I.P. to Breonna Taylor. Yeah, uh, yeah. Shout out to her. Um, I don't know if I should have said shout out. Should've. Nah, she, she deceased. Okay, rest yeah. in peace. But that's the era. Her name people. still lives on. Yeah, oh, okay. her name still lives on. Sandra yeah. Bland, we're going to keep it all yeah, rolling. Sandra yeah, Sandra Bland. Like, all these people are real people associated they're somebody's daughter, or somebody's aunt, sister, and somebody's friend. Somebody is missing that person. Somebody could have went to that person and talked to them, and they were taken away from us. You know what was iconic? The other day I was listening to a um, symposium, and the lady spoke, and she was like, Trayvon Martin would have been 26, 26 years yesterday. Old. That's crazy. Yep. I was like, 26. What in the world? You know what I'm saying? Just so much has happened in this lifetime. But I think about, really, he would have just really been coming into tune with himself as an adult. Like, the fact that, you know, that was taken from him, that he doesn't even get to celebrate his life, not because he did anything, not because he hurt anyone, but simply because he was a black male projected to be in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. They said he was in they the wrong place. They would say he was projected to be yeah. in the wrong place, right, based on someone else's opinion that you don't belong. And that's, again, going back to the proceeding with caution. I mean, it's just it's just the reality of it. And when people say they don't understand what, you know, what our defense is or for, to come back and say we ought to be happy because we had a black president. Who? What? 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 <laughs> What we, I mean, the fact that we just we we still we haven't that we have to acknowledge that is a a kind of gratitude. In two thousand and eight, we got a first black president. There were qualifying candidates way before two thousand and eight. Let's be let's be realistic about that. And there were people who did immaculate things that really should have sit in the seat that many of our previous presidents were able to do, but were not actually capable, I mean, able to do simply because of 
them being identified as African American or Black, and that's the reality. When we're talking about uh, living while Black, what it means to be Black, uh, I got a question of how does it affect us with regards to our career? You know, because our career is a, is an additional part of our life that's really big that we a lot of people connect their life to in general, just what I do for a living, right? So how does that play into your career, being black, living while black? Um, for me, the first thing that I think about, and shout out to my sister because I saw this on her page, representation matters. Mm -hmm. So for me, is I'm intentional about trying to be uh, an owner uh, in the field that I'm in, I'm intentional trying to be like out and about so that people can see that there are uh, black male therapists. I'm intentional just about what I do, hoping that the people behind me will continue to grow and get better and get bigger. Um, all of us met through a African-American female who went out on her own. She could have just worked mm -hmm. um, for somebody. But she went out on her own, did her own thing, and she's continuing to build year after mm -hmm. year after year. But we were able to connect to each other through her, mm -hmm. right? which has propelled us to this. Now, if everybody just keep doing that, like how big and how keep great reaching back. Yeah, we can be. But that's representation matters, the first thing that comes to my mind when I'm thinking about being black. Like I just, I want to be that person. I want you to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that before. Or, you know, that do exist. That's it for me. Y'all just gonna get silent on me like that. <laughs> I, man, I've been talking. I'm gonna, pay I'm gonna be quiet. Talk over here for me. Um, just showing up. Um, Amen. And being present, um, being an advocate, and I'm thinking about it. Just even when I was in the mental health field, being an advocate, you know, again for everybody, but mainly for my people too. When I say showing up, being present to let them know that, hey, there is someone here who does look like you, who's mm -hmm. been professionally trained to assist you in some of these problems you may not know about or some that you're coming here with. Um, being able to speak to some, not all, that African-American vernacular language to where they're able to resonate and, and hear me mm -hmm. and understand that I see you too, you know, and, right. and, and it's okay to not be okay in this space. And I'm here to assist and not judge you, not whatever myths or preconceived notions that you have about therapy. Hopefully I can be that person, that advocate to kind of diminish those thoughts or bring that wall, that barrier down that you may have. So that's what comes to mind. Man, I, I love when you say that. It's okay to be, not to not be okay, to create that space. I love it, man. We, we need more of those spaces. Mm -hmm. We do. For me and my profession, I just really think about how it was for me growing up. Mm -hmm. I, I had a one, I remember one African American educator in my building. I think I only had I only remember one professor. I one one I'm say one teacher. I had one black principal. I don't think outside of those two before reaching college I ever had another black teacher. Like I never had, you had that. how many? Two? two. Your whole Yeah. High school, middle school, everything. Yeah. Two? Two. Oh, and that's more than some people ever experience. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Wow. So, I, you know, and like I said, I had a principal, and and on top of that, both of them were male. Mm. Um, you know, again, shout out to the black male educators. Um, but that's all that I saw. Um, and they were two of the most influential people. You know, uh, most of the other spaces I only seen black people was in my neighborhood and in my church and in my direct community. But when we're talking about education, when we're talking about, um, you know, superintendents, when we're talking about school boards, I didn't see it. Now, it doesn't mean that didn't exist. They may have, but uh, in my household, we just, you know, wasn't, wasn't there. So in my current position, I love to be able to say I'm a black educator because there are there are students that need to know just like ty said i'm here with you i see you and I, I share some of your experiences not all right. um and so you don't always have to go 
or feel like you're you're not good enough. Like I want to empower and pour into you. You know what I'm saying? And that's where you know I kind of developed the idea, of the moments of inspiration, because I want to inspire you that you won't always be on that side of the table. There is a time when you will come forth, and I want you to know that you can be anything. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I've seen so many of us who are very intelligent not really be able to utilize that because nobody really told us it was an option. You know what I'm saying? And so in my profession now is let me inspire you that you can be more. I'm going to challenge you. I'm not going to accept the bare minimum from you when I know that you can give me more. You know what I'm saying? I, I can remember teachers letting our African-American boys sleep in class. You know what I'm saying? Letting them talk and do other stuff. And I'm like, okay, they missing this educational time because they sleep. So now they're getting further and further behind. And a lot of it was, you know, some of them wasn't even behavior problems. I'm like, why they get to sleep? But now being an adult, I understand why. Because it wasn't important for them to get their education. You know what I'm saying? So now being that voice, I'm a promoter of education. And I don't care how you go about obtaining it, whether you educate yourself or whether you go to school. Get all the knowledge that you can consume because that is the one thing no one can ever take from you. So that is what it means to be in the profession as an educator. As a therapist, I think I just attest with both of you guys in that in that space. And it's just being able to relate and embrace the people in such a way of where I'm not judging you regardless of where you are. You know what I'm saying? I, I've we've, we've heard, we've seen so many people get belittled. I've seen therapists come out of a out of a session and just kind of really degrade in experience but you don't understand that struggle you know that mother regardless of what you think about her whether she has three children four children whatever the case may be in most cases she really may be trying her very best she's just not being set up for success because it's never really been exposed to her mm. but you know what i'm saying when we give the opportunity to educate and empower people we can change people's lives versus you know what i'm saying making them feel lesser than what they already are if your life has already beat you down i don't need to come and add to that right. you know what i'm saying so that's that's my my thought about that you guys so Y'all know how I get sometimes, so. Yeah, hey. we, we can, we can hey. probably continue to go on and on about this particular so, uh, topic. Boy, I just did you know, all my words, Mr. <laughs> <so good. laughs> I don't know how I get sock out of topic, but um, one of the things I wanted to say in ending was um, less than 10% of black men use mental health services. Mm -hmm. um, also, I wanted to make a, make a note that constant exposure to stresses over a, a prolonged period of time can contribute to chronic health conditions mm -hmm. and exasperate uh, mental illnesses or maybe even uh, start them to some degree. Uh, we, we get that along with adverse childhood experiences, mm -hmm. right? So some of the things that we've been talking about has to deal with just that living while black, racism, mm -hmm. overt um, racism, um, microaggressions, mm -hmm. just the trauma. things that we're, trauma we're having to deal with from time to time, um, believe it or not, they impact our mental, mental health. Absolutely. We are here. Black male, um, black therapists are here, male and female mm. are here. Uh, and and it don't have to, world. you don't have to go necessarily to um, a black male or female therapist, just going to therapy in general, sure. just to kind of connect yourself. Just be, just be mindful of that, be open to it. Uh, I'm your host. Currently, I'm your host. We're working on some things here. <laughs> um, I'm your host. You can check out Speaking with Gravity on Instagram. You can check us out on Facebook. And if you do seek therapy, are you thinking about it? Reach out to us via those those two platforms, and we'll try to point you into the right direction. I want to thank Ty and Dee for coming through. Um, I think we should do it again. Are y'all open to it? Definitely, I am. Most definitely. I am. Can I say something before we close out? It's just echoing what you said about you said, stress. I thought I said I was a host. No, just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> he right, y'all, for the time being. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, I mean, you highlighting the importance of knowing what causes us stress and understanding that the physical and mental body go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we're noticing that we are experiencing 
chest pains, you know, back pains, abdominal pains. Really think about, all right, what am I, what am I really stressed about? What things have caused these physiological changes within my body? Um, and then assessing from there. So even if you aren't comfortable with reaching out to us or reaching out to a therapist or community mental health facility, what you can do, I would encourage everybody to just stop and breathe. Mm -hmm. Breathing alone creates a space within our mind and our responses on how we move forward. And that's something that doesn't cost anything, but also being being able to breathe properly mm. um and, and i'm gonna leave with that that does help reduce the stress hormones but come check us out though in addition <laughs> you know right. you're feeling up to yeah. it <laughs> all right thank y'all for taking the time to listen you could be doing anything right now but you chose to listen to us and we appreciate that remember i'm a therapist they're therapists they are therapists um but this ain't therapy it's just a podcast we're just talking here um uh, till the next time we're here now Oh